Ancient Greece is often remembered as a progressive, democratic and peaceful civilization populated by philosophers, rulers, athletes and artists. It was a society ahead of its time, it was the cradle of western civilization. In many ways there is a lot of truth to all that, but no society is perfect. It's impossible to hold those who lived thousands of years ago to today's standards of morals and ethics. And even by the standards of the ancients, every world is going to be afflicted by its fair share of deviance. That's right, today we will take a look at the most bizarre and outright crazy practices that were considered normal in ancient Athens. Ever since sexual activities exist, people try to figure out a way to avoid pregnancies. In ancient Athens, virginity was an important asset when it came to be a suitable bride and pregnancy was a clear sign a woman is not a virgin anymore. Of course, there were other situations where a pregnancy was unwanted and that's how people came up with a wide variety of weird contraception methods. Aristotle says that if a woman doesn't want to conceive, she should prepare her lady parts to this effect by smearing cedar oil, copper ore and incense diluted in oil. So Thanos had his own advices when it came to contraceptions. He encouraged women to spread various agents on the neck of the uterus, like olive oil, honey, cedar resin, juice of the balsam tree, and alum. In some cases, a tuft of wool was inserted into the mouth of the womb as a contraception method. All these treatments were believed to cause the mouth of the uterus to tighten and close up, so that the male seed is prevented from reaching the interior of the womb. However, if the semen have already found its way there, a different repertoire of plants was supposed to be used. Soranos mentioned a dozen of pungent pessaries, for example pomegranate peel is a frequently recurring ingredient. Other methods included walking, jumping, massages, baths or being bled. It was difficult for Athenian women to thrive in the economic sector because it was, first and foremost, often outside the boundaries of the household of which they were allowed. Some evidence suggests a law that restricted how much income a woman could make from a contract. However, other historical examples show that Athenian women made large incomes despite what was prescribed by the law. This leads historians to question whether or not this law was applicable for all women or if there were exceptions to the criteria. Supposing that there wasn't a strict law regarding income, Athenian law also forbade women from spending large sums of money. This law might be connected to the fact that, upon marriage, women were given quite large dowries that would ensure the women's expenses throughout her marriage. Thus, the influence of Athenian women in ancient Greece was often connected to the income they had. The greater the dowry in regards to their husband's income, the greater their say in the household. The representation of women in Athenian tragedy was undoubtedly performed exclusively by men and it is likely, although the evidence is not conclusive, that it was also performed exclusively for men. The question whether or not women were admitted at the theater is widely contested and tends to polarize fronts. Even though women were excluded from all public poetry, according to the historian Henderson, drama, like all public poetry in the classical period, was written, produced and performed only by men and the dramatic festivals were organized and controlled by the sovereign corporation of adult male citizens. So, it's not impossible to have female spectators. Archaeological evidence seems to point to the direction that women were admitted to try. Women, children, foreigners and slaves could take a seat only after male citizens were accommodated. Ancient Athenians held a firm belief that adultery was an unquestionably worse act than sexual assault. The assault wasn't so much a matter of violence against another human to the Greeks, so much as it was violence against property, that is, the property of the woman's father or husband. A perpetrator would therefore be punished with a fine and that's about it. Adultery, on the other hand, was thought to have a devastating impact on the family unit a vital institution in ancient Athens. Adulterers could be killed on the spot if caught in the act and the wife was immediately and legally divorced. The result of this strange mindset is that the women well-being was perceived as far less important than the stability of the family, which is basically synonymous with the stability of the society. This itself is a consequence of the ancient Greeks' attitudes toward women in general, which were far from kind. Given that the Romans developed their civilization around 1000 years after the ancient Greeks, it's worth mentioning that the infamous Roman toilets were in fact a Greek invention. There were public toilets for the elite, since using the toilet in front of or in the company of others used to be a privilege of royalty and nobility. These toilets consisted of slabs of marble or limestone which were flat and had interspaced holes along the length of it. Essentially they were long benches out in the open that typically had pipes of flowing water beneath them. 
This allowed the waste to flush to another place. For hand washing, there was a shallow channel of flowing water, although the cleanliness of it was relative. Instead of toilet paper, the ancient Greeks had to use small stones, stating that three stones should be enough to finish the job. And while we are on the topic of privacy, going to the bathroom in public wasn't that strange in ancient Greek culture. While the extremely wealthy could afford bathing facilities in their homes, private baths were very uncommon and most people bathed in the communal baths. Public baths became common throughout the 18th as a symbol of nobility. They were some of the most common and most important public buildings. Inside the baths, visitors were usually completely nude, thus removing the indication of class difference usually found in clothing. Common activity was socializing with the other visitors, building connections and discussing politics. Athens had the largest slaves population with as many as 80,000 in the 5th and 6th centuries BC with an average of 3 or 4 slaves per household except in poor families. The principal use of slaves was in agriculture but they were also used in stone quarries or mines and as domestic servants. Slaves were legally prohibited from participating in politics, which was reserved for citizens. Other slaves, such as the helots, were owned by the state. Slaves had fewer judicial rights than citizens and were represented by their masters in all judicial proceedings. A misdemeanor that would result in a fine for the free man would result in a flogging for the slave. With several minor exceptions, the testimony of a slave was not admissible except under torture. Slaves were tortured in trials because they often remained loyal to their masters. Despite torture and trials, the Athenian slave was protected in an indirect way. If he was mistreated, the master could initiate litigation for damages and interest. Conversely, a master who excessively mistreated a slave could be prosecuted by any citizen. This was not enacted for the sake of the slave, but to avoid violent excess. So which of these facts surprised you the most? What other weird things you know about the ancient Athens? Let us know in the comments below. And if you like this video, check out our other video dedicated to childhood in ancient Athens. Thank you for watching.